The candidates for this seat are Sheila Cascaden, Jim Baker, and Dave Perkins. The candidates have drawn numbers for the order in which they will speak and that for their opening statements and they are sitting in the same order. So we we'll would begin with opening comments from Ms. Cascaden. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for turning out. It's, uh, it's an important thing to uh, be at these kinds of forums to get acquainted with the candidates more than, than what you might read in the paper or just see, it, see us when we briefly meet you at the door. Um, I am a firm believer that you can get a lot done if you don't care who gets the credit. And I've tried to live that since I first arrived in Rochester right after graduating from the University of Minnesota. And I have spent my entire uh, adult life here in Rochester, uh, trying to make a difference for this community, whether that's as a manager of, of, of local programs, as a volunteer, as a community organizer, serving on boards and committees, starting organizations, or the 14 years that I had the opportunity to be Rochester's champion in the Minnesota State Legislature. So my, I view my career as being of service to the community, seeking the greater good, and trying to advance our community's interests. I think you, if you know me, you know that I have a history of being able to listen, of trying to bring people from different points of view together to find common solutions and, and to move our community forward. And I look forward to being able to continue that as an Old State County Commissioner. Thank you. Mr. Baker. Well, yes, my name is Jim Baker. Uh, I want to thank the League of Women Voters, the Post Bulletin, and the Chamber for this opportunity to address the voters. And addressing the voters is uh, of particular importance to me because I'm not a career politician or a longtime incumbent, so I don't have name recognition in the community. I have, however, uh, had a very successful career in management at IDM, raising to levels where I was responsible for large organizations and large budgets. And after retiring from IBM, I used those skills as a general manager of a local business employing about 25 people. So during my career I've developed these management and leadership skills that I think apply directly to what's needed in a county commissioner. I am running for office because I want to use these skills to give back to the community and now I'm now at a point in my life where I have the time and the expertise and the vitality to serve as county commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Uh, I'm Dave Perkins. Uh, I want to thank the league for putting on this uh, thing tonight. Uh, I believe I've demonstrated law, a large leadership in serving on the Olmsted County Board. Uh, <clears throat> my leadership, I focus mostly on budgets and fiscal responsibilities. I believe that for every dollar that I collect from a taxpayer and invest, I want to get maximum return on that investment. In 2012, our budget is 1.1% less than it was in 2011. We've reduced our headcount full-time employees in the county since 2006 by 109 people. And we're still providing some of the same quality service to the people that deserve and need this service. And we must continue to focus on reducing the cost in the future. Uh, we, uh, that's, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Our first question is from the League of Women Voters. We'll begin with Mr. Perkins. Uh, as you campaign and meet constituents, have you learned anything that has caused you to change your mind on an issue and what would that have been? No, I haven't. Uh, I'm still hearing the same story that people want less government, cheaper government. And they continue, we cannot continue to tax people out of their homes. And I'm concerned about that because we, as our population grows older, we're having more uh, retirees uh, living in Homestead County because of one thing, they're coming in from other areas because of the medical treatment they can receive here. But I think we've got to focus on, on uh, reducing the cost of government. If that means uh, uh, consolidating with uh, some departments from the city, uh, we certainly should look at that. Uh, we've done that already in the, in the, in the uh, dispatch. We've uh, combined the dispatch center with the city of Rochester, Homestead County. We've combined planning and zoning. And I think uh, information technology is one area that we've really got to focus on that we can't continue to have the city buy servers, the county buy servers, and we've got to be able to uh, uh, work together and share uh, our resources to reduce the cost. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Castaneda, please. 
I think I'd have to echo Dave's comment that I haven't learned anything that has changed my mind because usually people want to talk to you about a problem they're experiencing and, not, and you don't really have a lot of time at the door to get into great depth. I usually find that you really need to bring a lot of different points of view together to really understand an issue before you change your mind. But what I have learned is of some of the issues that people are concerned about right now. For instance, issues about adolescents who are having behavior problems and whether or not we're equipped to help families deal with their troubled adolescents here in Rochester or the fact that there's a water runoff problem that seems to be a problem between the city and the county and around Interlock and Lake and it's sort of feeling in and that the, the residents there feel like they've appealed to their county, to the county and to the city and they aren't getting results. And so what I'm finding is making a list of things that I know that if I'm elected, I will be doing some follow up on to try and, and find some remedy just as I did when we had the problems with the right of way acquisition around Highway 63 when that was a major construction problem and a major headache to all those property owners. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Yes, I would have to echo what uh, Dave and Sheila said, is um, the number one issue that uh, I've encountered is uh, property taxes. And Dave hit the nail on the head there, is to uh, reduce them at a minimum, not let them rise. I hear this mostly in the lower to middle income areas of the town and I hear it from business owners. Um, some of the, uh, the hot topics that I read in the paper I almost never come up when I ask people what issues they have, but property tax uh, certainly does. Another thing that uh, is a first time candidate that I've found interesting is how many people are excited that somebody new is running. That uh, it's encouraging for me, and it seems like people are, are anxious to see a little new blood in the, in our government. Okay, thank you. I want to remind you that you each have three rebuttal <coughs> opportunities. Uh, you have a chance to do one one rebuttal per question, and and three for the evening. Do we have any rebuttals at this point or comments? No, thank you. Okay, the next question will come from the post bullet, and we'll begin with Mr. Baker. How do you feel about uh, Silver, uh, Silver Creek Corner? It's the home for chronic inebriates. Would you have supported its development? Is Silver Creek Corner uh, another name for the wet house? Um, uh, that was one I'd have to look at very closely. Right off the hand, right off the cuff, uh, without having background in it, I would not support it. If there was extensive data said that that was an was a overwhelming economic reason for doing it, I would, uh, I would uh, certainly take a second look at it. But uh, that is not something I would go into it uh, thinking I was going to support. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. <clears throat> well, I went on record and I didn't support it, and I still don't support it because we're not providing upfront treatment for these individuals. We're allowing them to continue with their habits out there. Uh, I think the money can be better spent if we look at the uh, homeless uh, juveniles that was discussed earlier in tonight's uh, debate. Uh, we could be focusing on uh, providing assistance to those, those kids to make sure they stay in school and they can find out the dangers of what alcoholism can do to an individual as they grow older. And the other one is uh, the money could have been a lot better spent on uh, supporting our veterans that we have in Olmstead County. You know, we got over 10,500 veterans living in the county, and uh, they're all uh, going to need help sooner or later. Thank you, Ms. Skeen. When you have chronic inebriates, you have a public safety issue because the law enforcement people have to pick those people up wherever they find them and have to either take them to detox, take them to an emergency room, uh, get them off the streets so that they're not literally at risk of being run over or, or causing some other kind of harm. And so it's really a choice. It's not a pleasant thing to think that you have to spend taxpayer dollars on, a, on Silver Creek Corner. Uh, I know it was controversial, but you would be spending many more taxpayer dollars on those same individuals to take them repeatedly, time and time and time again, to detox. Uh, these are chronic inebriates. They have gotten to a place where they are, are, are really not able, not willing, um, in and out of treatment, has not worked. And so it's really a, a more uh, prudent investment for the taxpayer 
than to, to, to try and say we're not going to do that kind of program. I've had an opportunity to tour it when it was under construction and talk with the staff as they looked at this model. We know that it is, saves taxpayer dollars, it is more humane, and it protects the general public. I would have supported it. Thank you. I'd just like to make one comment. I, I don't believe it was worth spending $4 million for that type of a building. There was other locations within the city that we could have uh, probably placed these people, and uh, it's a very expensive operation. Any other comments? Well, Mr. Perkins, I would say that was uh, a decision that the county board made, but your comments were about not supporting the program, not the physical structure. And you'd really have to look at the long-term costs of other facilities, sometimes retrofitting them or using them operationally, the operational costs go much go up uh, much higher. So I still think that it was a bold decision by the county board to do that, and I commend them. Any other? Our next question comes from the chamber. We'll begin with Mr. Perkins. All three of you um, mentioned that property taxes were a top um, issue for your constituents or future constituents. What can the county do to reduce the property taxes? Well, one thing that we can do is look at how we streamline providing and delivering our services to the public. And the second is uh, we have to look at uh, uh, work more closely with the state of Minnesota and try to get some of our mandates removed. Uh, we've got so many unfunded mandates that we have to uh, provide the service and uh, We've got to look at working with the state on that. We've been working with them now for 20 years. Since 1990, I pulled all of the legislative agendas back, and uh, we've, every year we talk to them. Uh, just for one, one thing, uh, uh, in the last nine years, the state has transferred one, $137 million from the state funding, funding to Olmstead County property tax owners. So we've got to work. We cannot continue to accept that kind of uh, downfall to the county. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Well, controlling property taxes uh, starts with controlling spending. It's setting the budget targets early, working with the county administrators to make sure that the actual budgets they put together uh, meet those targets, and then continually working with the administration. That's on the normal side of it. I, I agree full heartedly with, uh, with Dave here on the mandates. The state and the federal have been all too free at sending down mandates that are unfunded and underfunded. I was looking at the uh, county website recently, and I was shocked to see that uh, one of the counties in Minnesota, one of the, in the cities, had done an analysis of their budget, and they claimed that 85% of the county's budget was driven by mandates. Uh, that's, that's just not acceptable. We need to be working with our legislators, pulling together other counties to make sure our voice is heard, and uh, doing all we can to get relief from those mandates. Thank you, Mrs. Meehan. Well, I agree with Mr. Baker that we <coughs> need to be working with our legislators, including how they balance the state budget, because a lot of what they did to balance the state budget transferred costs to local units of government that put pressure on property tax. And so when our legislators say that they did not increase taxes, they did increase property taxes with many of the decisions that <coughs> they made. I also think that we have to look at how we redesign services. Uh, this service delivery area that was mentioned earlier between the 12 and 11 counties is promising, promising for the future. I mean, that, the analysis of that, if it were fully in implemented, would have saved taxpayers in this region $6 million a year would have saved 30 million over 10 years, uh, I'm referring to the right figures, but also would have saved the federal and state government. So we need to look at not only property tax, but how we're saving taxpayer dollars overall. And some of what we need to do is provide the services that we're required to provide more efficiently. And uh, we've had some experience in doing that, um, and I think we can delve deeper into how to redesign services to get them to be more productive and less costly. Thank you, any other comments? Our next question is a lead question, uh, and we'll begin with Ms. Cascaden. What is your position on the zip rail? On the zip rail? Uh, well, <laughs> I have worked on high-speed rail for this community for about, well, uh, starting in 1992. I think that high-speed rail needs to be part of our transportation future. 
If you drive back and forth to the Twin Cities like I do all the time, you will just be astonished at how many people we have driving in from the Twin Cities who work here every single day, and how many Rochester people we have driving to the cities to work every single day. In addition, we have our, our main economic en engine is the Mayo Clinic. And if they can't bring patients to Rochester because these short hop airline, uh, air, air flights are not economically viable, we, become econ we have a big, big vulnerability as a community for our main economic engine. So we need to have a fast train that goes between the Twin Cities and Rochester, and eventually, hopefully, all the way to Chicago, because so much, many of the patients who come here to this destination medical community come from more than 80 or 120 miles. That is our economic future. It's at risk. Thank you, Mr. Baker. I have not looked at the uh, business case for high. Thank you, Sheila. I have not looked at the business case for the uh, uh, the zip rail. But let me say this: I would I would support it if the business case is self-supporting. It has realistic and conservative numbers in the business case and is modeled after successful high-speed rail projects that have proven not to be a burden on the taxpayers. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. As a member of the uh, Homestead County Rail Authority, I, I support the zip rail. Uh, we've got to make sure that we've looked at all of the uh, uh, pluses and minuses of, of high-speed rail between here and the Twin Cities. Uh, as Sheila stated, uh, we may not have air service in Rochester in years to come because uh, it's just not profitable for these airlines to fly on short uh, routes. Uh, we've got to come up with a solution to get the cars off the road with the price of oil, the price of gas, and the price of uh, maintenance of the road. So uh, I believe that we've got the consultants looking at it. I'm waiting to see what the, what the business case reads, but uh, I'm sure within the next 15 to 20 years, you probably will see some type of a rail between Minneapolis and St. Paul. In, or in Rochester, it may not be a high speed one, but it could be a medium speed. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? Our next question will come from the Post Bulletin and we'll begin with Mr. Baker. What future do you envision for Grand Park, the Olmstead County Fairgrounds? What role should the County Board take in shaping and directing that future? Well, I think that we should continue to make uh, modest improvements in Grand Park year after year. I am not in favor of uh, redeveloping uh, new fairgrounds for the, for the county. Make it short and simple. Thank you, Mrs. Keaton. I would say in all honesty, I would like a, a, a bit more information about Grand Park, but you look at that, that land in the heart of the city, and you look at how much it's used, uh, you know, for the fair, but also for hockey. Can we make better or more robust use of that facility? Can we make it into a community amenity that we can use for multi-purposes and that can be a source of uh, pride and economic vitality to the community as well? How do we get the, max, the best use out of that space? And it is a very substantial amount of space, and I understand that there have been uh, the Visitor Convention Bureau and others have gone to look at other kinds of conversions that other communities have done. And we maybe need to take a deep, deep look at this and not just be held to our traditions rather than our future. Thank you. Mr. Perkins? Well, we're working with the Friends of Graham Park, which is a group that was put together by the Chamber of Commerce about four or five years ago. <clears throat> They've come up with some great ideas on how Graham Park should look, both from the highway and within the park. Uh, I think the way we do we design the new uh, hockey rink out there, building four, having four <coughs> buildings tied together has made a big improvement. Uh, we're working with uh, uh, the uh, city on putting in rain gardens out there now to take care of the runoff from the water. But I'm sure if anybody would like to see a plan of what the future may look like at Graham Park, we have those down at the Government Center. <coughs> and the, Graham, the Friends of Graham and the Rochester Park Board, uh, Olmstead County Park Board meets monthly. And this is one of their subjects that they are always reviewing and how we can better utilize Graham Park out there because it is a very unique piece of property within the city of Rochester. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? Our next question will come from the Chamber of Commerce. We'll begin with Mr. Perkins. 
As we know, the county is made up of townships. Are there any um, ways that you would change the way that the county and the townships interact? Well, I think we have a good relationship right now uh, with the townships. Uh, I'm not so sure we need 18 of them in the county and then have a county board. But uh, we do share services. They do provide uh, uh, road maintenance probably cheaper than we do. Uh, but they are a different type of roads that they're, they're um, maintaining out there. Uh, within the county, we, we have a responsibility of, <coughs> excuse me, of maintaining 500 and uh, 35 miles of uh, roads in the county. Uh, we take care of all of the uh, bridges. There's 337 bridges in Olmstead County, if you weren't aware of that. Uh, four of them are still wooden bridges. So uh, we're working with the townships. I think uh, uh, we have a good relationship, probably the best I've seen in the last three, four years, and I hope it continues. Thank you, Mrs. Kaden. I also agree that the <coughs> relationship between the county and the townships have, have improved. I think that uh, a lot of that goes uh, to having more frequent communication and uh, attending to what the township interests are, not just the county's interests. And I think uh, I learned a lot in my last few years in the legislature when I represented a member of those townships and found it very instructive to attend their meetings, listen to what they had to say, and find the ways that we could, we could uh, work on, on uh, issues together. So I think it's better. I think it can still improve. And I think that some of the inherent conflicts aren't going away. So we need to have positive relationships to be able to deal with those issues. Thank you. Mr. Baker? Uh, short again, I think the uh, working relationship is, uh, is fairly good. Obviously, there's always room for improvement. But uh, all in all, uh, I think it's in good shape. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> A question from the audience. Without reducing existing transportation services and law enforcement, is it possible to reduce county services, the cost of county services, by 30%? We will begin with Mr. Baker. Uh, look, I'm a first-time candidate, so I don't have in-depth knowledge. Dave can probably take you deeper on that. Uh, my initial impression of that question is 30% probably not. Ms. Perkins? I, uh, I'd have to say that 30% is a big number. Uh, and with the, uh, with the uh, way Olmstead County is changing and how law enforcement is, is working, our, our jail costs <coughs> continue to go up every every year. It costs us right now about $90 a day to house a prisoner down there. We have to provide the same medical assistance to those prisoners as anybody in this room is entitled to in the city of Rochester. So that is a big expense for us. Uh, we've privatized that. We just did that in January. We are seeing the numbers come down. Uh, uh, that with, uh, with the new technology that we can put in squad cars, I believe we can probably reduce uh, the number of uh, of, uh, cars on the roads, but I'd be very cautious to consider that right now. But our biggest uh, expense right now, I think, in law enforcement is is uh, the jail and the county attorney's office. Uh, we are prosecuting some tremendously big cases in Olmstead County, expense ones. Thank you, Ms. Kaden. Thirty percent is overly ambitious, um, given the fact that our community is changing, given the fact that we have. Um, uh, I'm at the edge of the baby boomer boom, uh, generation, and we are entering a phase where we have more and more people who are dependent either because they're other eight, under 18 or over 85, then we have people in the workforce. Those people often require some kinds of, of assistance uh, from uh, long-term care or, or, or uh, in-home services that can be quite expensive, and the county has responsibility for making sure that those, those people are protected. We also, as Dave has mentioned, uh, excuse me, as uh, Mr. Perkins has mentioned, we have issues with law enforcement. We, when I worked in corrections in the 80s when we had 20 or 30 person jail. Um, we are long past those days, and uh, we do not want to jeopardize public safety by cur curtailing corrections um, uh, too extremely either. So I think 30% is not achievable. I think it is possible. 
to reduce, ex to reduce growth in expenditures, and as Dave has already pointed out to you, the county did reduce expenditures overall last year. Thank you. Any additional comments on that question? Our next question from the audience will be, will uh, go first to Ms. Piscaden regarding septic systems. Should the county work with the city of Rochester to allow the city to handle and take care of failing septic systems or to allow the county to take care of failing septic systems in the townships? I'm sorry, I'm going to just add a little codicil to what I said earlier. Don't forget the point that, that Mr. Baker made, which is absolutely accurate, that so much of what county government does is required by state, by the state and federal government, so there isn't a lot of flex in the county's uh, discretion in their budget. As far as septic systems goes, um, I think it really, the question really depends on where is the septic system failing. Is it a, are, are we had a good experience a few years ago, even though it was controversial at the time, with using some local option sales tax to extend city sewer lines into Marion Township to deal with some failing, failing septics. We had a similar experience, a little more controversial and difficult, with some of the, some of the community from the uh, neighborhoods within Rochester Township. So I think the question really depends on where are the septics failing? Is there a logical way to extend the septic, the uh, sewer lines? Is there a way to compensate the township for their, for their uh, costs? And what about the homeowners? So I think there's no, there's no one-size-fit-all answer to that question. Um, but clearly with our karst topography, having a failing septic systems around the county also means our water supply is in jeopardy for our community and for many communities. And so we do have to pay attention. Thank you, Mr. Baker. <coughs> uh, Failing septic systems is a topic that is a new candidate I am not familiar with, so I'll pass it on to Mr. Perkins. Well, the uh, <clears throat> county is responsible for inspections of new and old septic systems. Uh, and we work very closely with the homeowners on that. We've also arranged that if a septic system has to be replaced, we can arrange financing through the state uh, over a five or ten year period for these people to replace their septic systems. One example is out at Chester, Chester uh, out on Highway 14 East. We now maintain a, a, uh, a station out there where we, all of the homes out there now are hooked on to a central uh, uh, system and nobody has septic systems out there anymore. It's working out very well. They, they pay a monthly fee for that and uh, we manage it and we monitor it and it's working very well. Thank you. Any additional comments on that question? Our next question from the audience. Uh, would it be possible to list on a real estate statement a detailed service by service list of where our tax, tax dollars are going? We'll begin with Mr. Baker. Well, that information, if somebody wants it, is already available through the county government. And to go to the expense of detailing it on everybody's tax statement seems to me like not a good use of our taxpayer dollars. For those that need that information, it's readily accessible. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. Well, I, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that we have, what we put on that tax statement is uh, kind of dictated to us by the state. But uh, if you want the information, it's on our County website. I'll just, for example, public safety, which is the sheriff's department, the jail, and the county attorneys, uh, $23.6 dollars, six million dollars. That is levy dollars that we collect from the taxpayers of Rochester. Public works, 9.2 million dollars that we collect from the taxpayers. Although the budget for uh, uh, public health is 11.4 million, we collect 5.6 million from the taxpayers to support that. The rest is done by grants fees that we charge for inspections and then some of the service that we provide. And uh, human service is the biggest one, $54.5 million. Of that, 27.4 is levy dollars. Uh, that information would be probably mean boggling to a lot of people uh, reading their tax statement. Thank you. Any additional comments on that? 
Oh, sorry, and Ms. Skaden, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> I don't think I have much to add from what, uh, what the other two gentlemen have said. I, it would be very, very difficult to get to the service level that I understood for that question to pose. Uh, it is, you really do have to get into a great deal of detail and the budget sheets to get to a service level. We could do maybe something like a pie chart kind of thing to give you a general sense. But don't forget your tax statement also includes city tax and school district tax. So when you start talking about all those services, it would be I laughed, I kind of laughed when the question came up because it would be multiple pages to list all the services. So uh, it's, it becomes a, a difficulty and impractical. And then it's just like getting one of those um, statements we get from our insurance company, you know, do not pay this, this is a statement of what your charges were, expl <laughs> explanation of benefits. And you look at it and you think, I don't even want this. Why are they wasting the money sending it to me? I think we might get into that kind of situation where we can do it as Mr. Baker and Mr. Perkins says, electronically, online, and um, with, a, with more detail and categories for those of us who really want to pursue that. Thank you. I'd just like to add that before our budget is adopted, we have a truth and taxation meeting in December of every year. And the audience, uh, the public is invited to that. It lasts about three hours. And we do go through the budget uh, by different categories to show how the expenses are being uh, spent. And uh, just one example. Uh, uh, in 2011, it cost uh, every taxpayer uh, $1,067. Is what uh, if you took the population, divided it by the end of the budget, it's uh, $1,067 per person. Thank you. Our next question. Just a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just an extra uh, comment on what uh, Ms. Cascaden said is I thought the Pulse Bulletin did a great job earlier this year speaking of pie charts full page color spread of both the city and the county government with quite detailed break, breakdown. I thought it was uh, quite a good piece of work by the, uh, by the Post Bulletin and should satisfy that uh, questioner's answer, I think. Thank you very much. Our next question will begin with Ms. Skaden. Would you support implementation of a drug court in Austin County? I know that a drug court has been proposed uh, here many times. I don't know the reasons why the county board has rejected it. I know it's been very successful in many counties uh, in, in having a great impact in getting people to, to uh, be accountable for their behavior, change their behavior, and get on a good course. Uh, so I'm open to that idea. I have not heard from uh, the county board's perspective why they have not felt that they could fund that. I do know that in the past our judges have felt that our, our, the judicial load for this district was really very high and having a specialty court like that aggravates the scheduling for all other kinds of cases. And so it may be that it came more from the court's perspective around man, uh, manpower and human power to staff the courts than it did from any kind of budget perspective. But I do know that, that our county attorney has been a strong advocate and has been very, used very successfully in Dodge County and other counties. Uh, thank you, Mr. Perkins. I, uh, I would support the drug court, but right now it's a little hard to finance it with uh, our policy. That we just don't want to add any new programs to the budget. Uh, I think we've got to do a little more looking at the, what the payback would be. And if, if the payback is great, uh, is, is enough, then I think the county board would be receptive to supporting a drug court. Uh, as Sheila said, it's very effective in Dodge County, Wabasha County. And I'm sure that uh, as you peel it back, there has to be some savings to law enforcement to keep these people out of jail uh, at $91 a day to house a person in the jail. Uh, I think it's not a dead issue. We continue to talk about it. It comes up uh, three or four times a year. Our, our county attorney is uh, really uh, supportive of the drum court, and uh, he's got his people trained and ready to go. Thank you. Mr. Baker? I would be supportive of it if it will truly bring those long-term savings that uh, both Ms. Cascaden and uh, Mr. Perkins uh, think that uh, think that would have. Again, though, I applaud the uh, the county board for being very cautious to add new programs in this time when we're trying to uh, hold the lid on the uh, on the property taxes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on that question? Uh, I think we'll squeeze in one more question before your closing statements. This has to do with gang population in the county. 
What are your plans for dealing with the increase in gang population in Elmstead County? We begin with Mr. Perkins. Well, first of all, we've got to work closely with the Rochester Police Department and our county uh, and the surrounding counties. We we got to re uh, reinvent or restaff the gang task force that, uh, that we had uh, going a few years back. It's kind of uh, gone by the wayside, but I think uh, uh, as we see the gang activity increase in the county and the city, this is a joint venture between us and them. Uh, the county cannot, suffice, cannot solve the gang uh, activity within the, the city or the county. It's going to take help from the city and the county and the surrounding areas to uh, curtail a drug uh, gang activity. Thank you. Mr. Baker? Well, I would agree with Mr. Perkins that uh, uh, reinstating the, grant, the, uh, the gang task force, uh, working with the uh, city are imperative. Is I've been out talking to people and I have talked to a lot of them. This is one of the topics that often comes up is a feeling of safety in some parts of the uh, some parts of the community. So it's, it's certainly something that needs to needs to be looked at, particularly for a community like ours that uh, has people from all over the world coming in. It, they need to feel safe when they're here. We, we, everybody in this room uh, would agree with that. Our community has a history of finding ways that we can collaborate to solve complex problems. This is a complex problem. It isn't just about the kids who are in the gangs today. It's about what's going on in the broader community that's making them feel alienated, hopeless, a feeling like they need that kind of protection in the gang. And it isn't just about <coughs> them when they're teenagers or in their 20s, but it's what's happening to families and, uh, and as they come into our community or as they get integrated in our community earlier, uh, early in the children's lives. So what's happening with families, what's happening with young children, what's happening with adolescents. We, uh, I, I recall times that we decided in our community that we were going to take a stand against domestic violence. And we brought together a 60-person task force representing many different kinds of stakeholders. And we met for about a year and a half and came up with a plan for what we would do in our community that ended up being very cutting edge. It was a five-year plan. We implemented that plan. We have the capacity to do that. It's going to take social services, education, law enforcement, um, public health, it's going to be, have to be a broad community-wide effort if we really want to turn the tide and stop gangs from forming and stop uh, and protect the public safety. Any additional comments on that question? We'll go on now to our closing statements for each candidate. You have one minute to make your closing statement. We are going to begin with Mr. Baker, go on to Ms. Cascaden, and finish with Mr. Perkins. Well, once again, I want to thank the uh, League of Women Voters, the Post Bulletin, and the uh, Chamber for this opportunity to address voters. You know, when this country was founded, uh, one of the visions was that electric, uh, elected service, uh, uh, the average citizens would step up and uh, uh, temporarily take those positions, step out of their private lives, serve, and then return to uh, private life. And the, the temporary nature of this would uh, help keep those in service grounded to the real world, as well as provide a uh, uh, steady flow of new blood into the, uh, into the government. And it's partly this ideal that brings me here today, is that average citizens need to step up to the plate and offer to serve. And I understand why more people don't do it, because it's extremely hard work, and it's expensive. But if average citizens don't come home, come up to the, uh, come forward, and then we resign ourselves to being uh, governed by a political class who all too often sees electric service as a, uh, a, a career opportunity. So my name is Jim Baker. I am a well-qualified average citizen who is asking for your vote as commissioner. And I'll work hard, be a good steward of the position, and a good steward of our taxpayer dollars. Thank you, Mrs. Caton. Well, Mr. Baker, I'm also a citizen of this community and have been for a long time. You and I both lived here a long time, although we don't really know each other. Uh, I would just say that uh, the kind of citizenship that I've had has been extended not only when I was in elected office, but before and since I've been in elected office. Um, I learned that good ideas come from people of all political persuasions, all points of view, all walks of life. And whether I've been a consultant, a community volunteer, or an elected official, I've worked with citizens to solve problems for this community. Earlier, Greg Wright talked about needing judgment and having trust. And I think that uh, people in this community know that 
I've tried to apply my best judgment in their service, and I think they can trust me to listen to them. I have pledged to continue to listen to all citizens, and whether I'm an elected F office or not, I will be working to find solutions for our common problems that are fair to, to all. I think that there is some value to experience. There's a value to people who have worked with, with a diverse group of people for many years to find solutions and advance our community. And I offer to do that and stand before you asking for your vote on August 14th. Thank you, Mr. Perkins. I'd like to also thank the League and the Post Bulletin and the Chamber for this uh, forum tonight. And also I'd like to thank the people in the audience for showing up. This shows that there's still interest in local government. Uh, I'd also like to thank the people of District 6 for their support over the past several years. And for those of you who are new in my district, I picked up about, uh, my district changed about 38%. I uh, look forward to working with you and getting your ideas on how government should be changed. I think I've proven my leadership on the county board, uh, which has produced many positive uh, results. We've brought the budget down to where I think uh, we're on the right track. And I will continue to represent you in a, response, in a responsible way. Uh, the primary is August 14th. Every vote counts, and I hope I can count on your votes out there on the 14th. Thank you. Thank you.